Again, welcome everyone. I'm Cheryl Scolis, the Agricultural Safety and Health Specialist with the UW Center for Ag Safety and Health. And today we're going to be talking about keeping yourself safe when working with animals. Um, we have a great team here today and um, a lot of different backgrounds and experiences of working with, with cattle. Um, so I would like to introduce our presentation team. First off will be Jackie McCarville. Jackie is the Agricultural Extension Educator in Greene County. Our next presenter will be Sarah Grochen, the Ag Extension Educator in Dairy and Livestock for Ottagamie County. Our next presenter will be Ashley Olson. She is the Agriculture Extension Educator for Vernon County. Following Ashley will be Lissa Seafelt, the Dairy and Livestock Agent for Eau Claire County. And then bringing up um, our program will be Amber O'Brien, the Agricultural Extension Educator from Calumet County. I'd also like to um, recognize a couple of other members of our program team for today. Carl Dooley, who is the Agricultural Education Agent in Buffalo County, as well as Jim Versweibelt, um, who is an ex Extension Educator for Walworth County. For those of you that are listening in on our Spanish audio today, we appreciate um, the help of Jim Larson and Eric as our interpreters. And I apologize, Eric, I just lost your, your last name. So please share that um, with the group, um, as well as our assistance from the UW Extension um, Office of um, Access and Inclusion. And, and Carlos has been helping us set up. So welcome everyone again, and we are glad that you are here today. We will be using a couple of features as we go through this program, one of them being the chat box. So if you have questions or comments, please feel free to use that chat box. And um, we will have a couple of our team members monitoring that chat box for you. We will also be using the poll feature for a couple of quick and easy questions for you. Um, so when it comes that time and we launch the poll, we would greatly appreciate your involvement with that. So with those introductions, I would like to get us into today's content and subject matters. So here we go. So our biggest thing today that we're talking about is preventing injuries to the people when we're working with cattle. And as an occupational safety and health specialist, you know, I broke this down into three different factors that we look at for preventing injuries or illnesses when working with cattle. The first part gets to be preventing that, that injury to the workers. So that human factor comes first and the importance of um, a lot of different parts of being that safe worker. But at the end of the day, we want everybody going home safe, not injured, not sick. Um, so the person comes first. The second factor that we consider is the animals that we are handling and their welfare. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very important factor when we look at injury prevention and a factor that's a lot different than other industries because these are live animals that we're working with. Our third factor that we look at is reducing those workplace hazards. What are those different situations that you can look at in your specific production area that could be a risk to those workers, to those animals and the combination of? So we're gonna to touch upon each of these three different factors today as we move through this presentation. But to start with, we could give you a variety of different statistics and look at the fatalities, but our team member, Jackie McCarville, had a recent experience and Jackie was willing to share it. 
So Jackie, do you want to tell us about these images that we're looking at and your experience? Sure. So just a little background. Uh, I have always lived on a dairy farm, grew up on a dairy farm. And what happened to me this summer, I never imagined happening to me ever. Um, we have a bull that we keep on our farm that normally goes to pasture to breed our heifers. And this year with COVID and everything happening, he stayed in our cow yard. Um, he was a little snotty, had a little bit of an attitude. Uh, about the time he developed this attitude, COVID hit, the meat plants were backing up, prices were not very good. So we held on to him a little longer than we should have. And one morning when we were time to switch cows, uh, my husband who normally goes and gets the, the switch cows in was nowhere to be found. So I went out into our cow yard to go bring in the switch cows. Um, I went to the right, the bull was to my left, kept my eye on him the entire time. As I was walking to go get some cows, he was kind of giving me a funny feeling. He had his head down, was really paying attention to where I was. And about the time I decided I didn't feel comfortable out there in the cow yard with him anymore, he actually came and attacked me. Um, so I was down. Uh, I had my my knees bent to protect my upper body to make sure he didn't come at any of my ribs or anything. And I just remember like I was screaming for help. And then like all of a sudden at the end of the bunk, I could see my husband coming towards me to save me. Um, the bull backed off as soon as my husband got close. Uh, and so then I put my two arms out and said, help me get up. And I looked at my right arm and I'm like, oh, I think my arm is broken. And so we got me into the barn and next thing you know, we went to the emergency room and I had broken my bones uh, over by my wrist in multiple locations and it was shattered pretty good. Um, so I spent a week in a cast and then a week later I had to get a, a plate with a bunch of screws put in and then you know, I got a nice two month vacation from the farm, but then I also had to like regain the strength in my wrist and in my arms. So what should have been a, a very easy preventable accident uh, kept me out of the barn for two months and changed my life forever. I mean, it took me 36 years to break my first bone. So next. Well, thank you for sharing that, Jackie. You know, I think there's a lot of different animal handling experiences out there. I have both stories of my own from, from time on the farm, but it, it gave us a lot of factors to think about and the importance of, of preventing these injuries and those signs that we can get from those animals. So we have our first poll question um, that Amanda is going to launch for us. And that first question is, have you or someone working on your farm experienced an animal related injury? Yes or no? So we'll give you a couple of seconds here to respond to the poll. Okay, it looks like we have slowed down here on the responses, so we've stopped that. Um, if we look at the results, um, that, you know, the greater percentage of us, 62%, have had an injury working on the farm that's animal related. So um, different, different factors that I'm sure each of those incidents could be looked at for. And so let's look a little bit more now um, at some dangers when working with cattle. And you can see we have a whole variety of them here and different factors and, and different situations that we can look at those three factors and parts that we talked about. 
earlier. Coming at this from um, the agricultural safety and health specialist side, I just wanted to take a moment because it usually comes into question of what regulations apply to worker safety when we're working with animals. And so in this, um, in when we're working with animals, if we look at our federal regulations, the general duty clause of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 is the regulation that we would be looking at. This um, duty clause applies when you have one non-family member employee. However, some of you may be familiar with OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the Appropriations Act may not use funds to inspect on operations with 10 or less employees. So while you may have heard in the past that OSHA doesn't apply to smaller farms, um, the, the act itself does. And whether there's a regulation or not, you know, it's important for all of our workplaces to be safe workplaces and that we work to do our best to prevent injuries and illnesses. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Sarah Grochen to talk about um, some of the, the human factor, the person factor. So Sarah. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm glad to be with everyone today. It is cold out there, so a lot of the things we're going to be covering, um, you can apply uh, in this type of weather. Um, so the most important thing, uh, one of the most important things uh, when you're working with animals is to dress correctly for the job. Um, a hazard review would be the best practice to put into place to um, minimize the injury of workers in the workplace. Find where those hazards are and provide the uh, correct personal protective equipment or PPE as required after the hazard reviews. So as you can see, uh, we have a selection of different PPE that you may be uh, needed to wear in different circumstances on the farm. Safety glasses uh, would be in place for keeping debris out of your eyes or chemical uh, fumes. Um, so uh, footwear with good soles, of course, uh, a lot of farms have slippery uh, conditions. So uh, good tread on your boots is very important. Gloves, um, not only in cold weather to protect your skin from the elements, but um, protecting your skin from uh, harsh chemicals that you may be working with on a daily basis. And lastly, always uh, make sure that the PPE is comfortable, um, weather appropriate. Uh, winter, obviously you need warmer clothing and uh, in the hot weather you need cooler clothing. Um, so uh, with that, we'll, um, next slide please. So safety tips for workers in the working environment. Most importantly, always dress properly for the weather. In cold weather, remember that cotton, when it gets damp or wet, it loses its insulation ability. So a lot of times we uh, suggest to wear wool or silk or even, or even synthetic um, material for the uh, first and second layer to keep that uh, body dry. Because like I said, um, cotton can get wet um, especially if you're in the barn and you're working hard and you're sweating, um, cotton will not have that insulation uh, properties as well as those other uh, three types of um, material. Um, make sure that your uh, clothing is not tight fitting. We want that to be a, a fairly loose so there is that airspace to insulate your, your body. Um, so do not wear tight fitting clothes. Make sure that you cover your head um, with a hat or a hood, 10% of your body heat is lost from your head. So um, make sure you have a nice hat on in, in cold weathers. And also, um, if it's really cold, make sure your nose and your mouth are covered with some sort of knit material or collar or something that'll protect that part of your face as well. Um, and then don't forget your feet and your hands. Um, make sure you have insulated gloves, insulated boots, uh, water resistant if necessary. 
In addition to the way you uh, dress, you should always monitor your own condition and your coworkers alike um, during um, extreme weather temperatures. Um, don't forget about coworkers that go out on their own to do a task outside by themselves. Always monitor yourself and your coworkers. Um, be aware of weather and changing patterns. Say it's cold out, but at, at a certain time there isn't a wind and all of a sudden a, a large wind comes. Take that into consideration if somebody has been gone for a long time. Stay dry in cold weather and stay cool in hot weather. Keep extra clothing handy in cold weather in case your socks get kind of uh, sweaty or, mo or moist, other parts of your uh, clothing, so that you can change into dry clothing. So always keep an extra change of clothing around. Stay hydrated. Drinks for alert people. Um, sometimes in, in really severe cases, people are not alert, so therefore drinking with uh, any type of drink uh, would not be appropriate. But stay hydrated, whether it be cold or hot weather, drink a lot of water. No alcohol, alcohol dehydrates the body, so stay away from alcohol. And use safe work practices. Um, engineering controls, so go to a heated room if, if it's very cold or go to an air conditioned room if it's very hot. Um, use wind breaks if you're working outside and it's windy. And always remember the personal protective equipment. Next slide, please. Employer responsibilities in the work environments. Employers have a responsibility to train the employees on the hazards of working in colder heat. You, the best practice would uh, be a, a quiz so that um, you know the level of knowledge your workers have obtained um, and always go over uh, what they should do in case somebody does have heat or cold stress. What are the steps they should take? Um, include the safety measures if a person experiences cold or heat. So what are the first aid practices that they should use? And definitely ensure safe work practices and seek engineering controls as in cold, make sure you have a place for them to take a lot of breaks in a warm room. And on the flip side, make sure in hot weather that you have a, a cool place that they can uh, take a lot of breaks during their, um, during their work day. Next slide, please. So prepare for the weather. There's risk factors during extreme weather and in cold, one of the risk factors is wet, wetness and dampness, even from body sweat. Um, we covered this a little bit uh, in a prior slide, but um, like I said, um, you need to have dry clothing on. Um, so have a change of clothing and um, that means socks or uh, shirts, anything like that. Um, keep an extra set of, of clothing around that. You can always switch from damp clothes to dry clothes. Um, dressing improperly is a, is a risk factor. So you do not want tight fitting clothes. Um, you want to dress in layers, preferably three layers, uh, two layers of wool, silk, or um, synthetic material. And then the outer layer should be um, a windbreak if it's windy or uh, if it's raining, you should have uh, uh, a coat on that has um, water resistant properties to keep you dry. Um, wind chill. So uh, tune into the weather forecast because as we have cold temperatures and the wind increases, it, it, it is a, makes for a more of an extreme um, circumstance. So um, listen to the radio, TV for wind chill um, alerts. Exhaustion is another risk factor. Acclimation um, is a risk factor. So if you're dealing with workers that are not acclimated to that type of weather, whether it be extreme cold or extreme heat, you need to acclimate the workers slowly. Um, so their body gets used to working in that type of environment. Any type of predisposing health conditions, hypertension is one, hypothyroidism is another, diabetes, um, you are more prone 
to uh, risk during extreme weather conditions. And lastly, if you're in poor physical condition, whether you have a heart condition, overweight, anything that would lead to where your body is struggling, um, on an average day, it's going to even be harder for that person during extreme temperatures. Um, on, the, on the hot side, I, uh, a lot of the same type of situations, acclimation is critical, hydration is crucial, um, especially if it's high humidity and there's no breeze, take that in consideration. High exertion or continuous work without breaks. If you've had a recent illness, take that in consideration as well. Again, personal risk factors. If you've had heat illness before, you're more prone to it again. And lastly, poor physical condition is again a risk factor for extreme heat temperatures. Uh, next slide, please. So um, with cold weather, we have alerts um, and these are put out by the National Weather Service. So always stay in tune to the weather, whether it be radio or TV. And you will find that they have three different categories of alerts. The uh, less, least threatening would be the wind chill advisory. And this is when cold weather is expected. Um, so this is a, a, a caution to everybody to expect this type of weather. Um, frostbite or hyperthermia could occur without precautions. And dress in layers and cover up exposed skin. The next notch up for um, alert uh, would be wind, wind chill watch. And this is when the weather uh, situation is expected. Uh, so take action, be prepared for this type of weather, check your forecast and prepare for dangerously cold weather. And the highest level of an alert is a wind chill warning. So this is, it is going to happen. Dangerous cold is expected. It could come with strong winds, which wind chill will kick in. Uh, frostbite and hypothermia could occur in minutes. So limit the time outside dress in layers, cover exposed skin. And if you have tasks that need to be done outside, try to reschedule them so that you're working more in the warmer part of the day rather than in the colder part of the day. Uh, next slide, please. Just one moment, Sarah, for our interpreter to catch up. Okay, Amanda, let me know when I can go. All right, I will. Okay, the interpreter's ready. Okay, thank you. I'll try to talk a little slower. I know I tend to talk fast. Sorry about that, everyone. So in cold weather, uh, we need to be concerned about frostbite. And frostbite um, is the freezing of the skin and underlying tissues. And this normally occurs in the extremities. So we're talking about your hands and your feet and possibly your legs and your arms. The body shifts the blood to keep it uh, warm. It shifts the blood from these extremities to the inner core of your body to maintain a 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit temperature. So it's shifting the blood from your extremities to your abdomen and your chest. So um, this isn't necessarily a life-threatening situation. However, in severe cases, if it's not taken care of, it, it can cause uh, amputation. So it is severe in that sense. So some of the symptoms that we see during frostbite is bluish or pale skin, numbness or tingling in your fingers or toes or feet. The skin feels firm and hard. And in severe cases, blisters may occur. So first aid 
always call 911 or seek medical attention immediately. Do not walk on your frostbitten feet or toes as this can worsen the condition. And do not rub the area to warm it because that will uh, worsen your skin condition. The best way to warm frostbitten fingers or hands is to put them in the armpit because your armpit is warm. So skin to skin warming is the best way to warm frostbitten fingers or hands. Um, you can warm them with warm water only if you know what temperature it is. Because when you have frostbitten hands, you can't tell if it's hot water or not. It may be too hot and you may burn your hands. So, and then lastly, uh, make sure that you loosely cover and protect the area from any more cold contact. Uh, a more severe case of cold stress is called hypothermia. And this is when the body temperature drops to 95 degrees or below. The stages of hypothermia depend on how long this person has been exposed to severe cold. Um, so there's varying degrees of hypothermia. A person can be alert in the early stages and comatose in the later stages. So be aware that um, different uh, symptoms may be there depending upon um, the severity of hypothermia. Um, on the onset of hypothermia, there's shivering, stomping of feet. This is the person trying to generate more heat in their body. They may feel fatigued and they may have loss of coordination and may be fumbling with their hands. In later stages, hypothermia can affect your brain. Um, so confusion and disorientation may set in. A lot of times when person is suffering from hypothermia, because their brain is infected, uh, affected, they don't even know what's going on. They don't know that they're suffering. So just keep that in mind. Um, always know where your coworkers are, especially if they're working alone. Okay, so the first aid, always move a person to a warm, dry place. Call 911 immediately. Remove any wet clothing and replace with dry clothing and cover with layers of blankets, but do not cover their face. Next slide, please. So on the flip side, we also work in very hot temperatures. And just like we have wind chill warnings, we also have heat alerts. So we need to know the difference of the severity of these alerts. So the least or the most minor alert is called a heat outlook. And this is an alert that says excessive heat event will be with us in three to seven days. So they're making notice that this is coming and you should be, and you should start to prepare. Maybe change your schedule a little bit or make some plans that you could work in the cooler parts of the days rather than the heat, the high heat part of the days. Okay, from there we move up a notch to a heat watch. When the weather issues a heat watch, they're saying we have an excessive heat event that's going to happen in 12 to 48 hours. Again, prepare for this, take plans. And the highest, most major heat alert is called a heat warning or advisory. They are saying we are going to witness a heat warning or a major heat alert in the next 36 hours. So take action now and plan accordingly. Next slide, please. So on the onset 
uh, of heat stress is heat exhaustion. This can occur first, um, and it can occur from excessive sweating. So your body sweats, and the evaporation of your sweat cools your body. That's the natural occurrence of cooling your body in, in very high uh, temperatures. Um, but if you have excessive sweating, your body is losing all those fluids. So heat exhaustion can set in. And the symptoms can be headache, nauseous, dizziness. You can feel weak or irritable. You can be very thirsty and have heavy sweating. You can have an elevated body temperature and decreased urine output. So make sure that you drink plenty of water to keep hydrated. It is the, one of the most important things going into working in the heat is to make sure that you are hydrated and dress appropriately. Wear cool, light colored clothing. Um, try not to get sunburned. Wear a hat with a brim. Um, and like I said, drink a lot of water and always take a lot of breaks in a cool area. Find where there's a breeze um, or in an air conditioned area and take many breaks to, so that your body can recuperate from the heat. If somebody is, is, um, if somebody is suffering from heat exhaustion, you should call 911 and stay with the person until help arrives. Move to a shaded cool area, give liquids to drink, remove unnecessary clothing if they're dressed kind of more than they need to be. Um, ask them if they would like uh, you know, a cool compress and again, encourage frequent sips of cool water. That'll help them recover from heat exhaustion. Next slide, please. Heat stroke. Now this is more serious than heat exhaustion. Death can happen if treatment is delayed. So you need to take action immediately. Symptoms include confusion and slurred speech. You can have a loss of consciousness and the person can go into a coma. They can have hot, dry skin or profuse sweating, seizures, and a very high temperature. And like I said, if they are not treated and this goes without treatment, death can happen. So this is a very serious, serious condition. When somebody suffers heat stroke, and that's when their temperatures rise to 106 degrees or higher, in 10 to 15 minutes. Call 911 immediately. Again, stay with the person. Move to a shaded, cool area. Remove outer clothing. Cool them down as quickly as you can. And try to circulate the air around the person. If there's a breezy, shady area, that would be best. Next slide, please. So, in summary, how do we avoid the cold or heat stress? First of all, hydrate. Drink plenty of water and avoid sugary beverages as well as alcohol. Water is the best and you can't drink enough when, it's, when you're going to be working in really hot weather. And as well, remember, you need to stay hydrated in really cold weather as well. Secondly, stay cool. So if you're working in hot, consider moving more physical tasks to the cooler part of the day and take more breaks in cooler areas. And lastly, dress for the weather. Wear lightweight, light colored, loose fitting clothing. And in the end, if, every, if anyone is suffering from either heat stress or cold stress, make sure that you call 911 immediately, seek medical attention, and make sure you contact your supervisor to let them know what is happening. Sarah, thank you so much. Lots of, of information there. 
Um, it's hard to, to think about hot temperatures in the cold weather that we're experiencing. Hopefully a lot of content that people can take and talk amongst their um, farm teams with related to heat, cold, and, and some of those personal items. With that, we're going to switch into cattle behavior and handling, and we're going to have Ashley joining us. So Ashley Ocean, Olson from Vernon County again. Ashley, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Thank you, Cheryl. So I'm going to touch a little bit on, since we are working with worker safety and animal handling, how cattle behavior fits into animal handling. And wanted to start with a quote, understanding the behavior of animals helps prevent injuries to both people and animals from Dr. Temple Grandin, if, if any of you are familiar with her. So next slide, please, Cheryl. So to start, cattle are like prey animals. They, they like to be together in a herd. They can be protective. And so having some of this in mind, we're gonna discuss some key factors of good cattle handling and how it can help us um, prevent injuries to ourselves working with the animals. And next slide. So two of the things that we're gonna look at are the flight zone and the sensory perceptions of cattle. And on this slide here, I'm basically showing what the flight zone is with cattle and when we're working with them. So the size of the flight zone varies depending on how accustomed the cattle are to their current surroundings and the people. And um, one thing to note on here is the point of balance, which is um, pointing up to the front shoulder, if you can see that on, on the animal. And um, so some of the um, guidelines that correspond to the cattle's flight zone include determining the edge of the animals or the group by we slowly will walk up to them and then we'll move away when we've entered their flight zone. We'll also want to make sure that we're working on the edge of the flight zone as we can see where Cheryl's been pointing at the flight zone boundary. We want to avoid entering the animal's flight zone too deeply or quickly as this may cause them to bolt away or try to back uh, past us, which could injure us. And we want to retreat from their flight zone if we want them to stop moving. We want to quietly move cattle using their natural flight zone. And again, we want to be able to move them forward by moving towards their rear, past their point of balance, which again is their shoulder, we want to be able to stop the cattle or back them up while in a chute by moving forward past their point of balance. We want to also allow the cattle to follow one another in the direction that they are facing. And we want to concentrate on moving the leaders in the group rather than the rear animals of the group if, if the cattle start to bunch up. And so this is just a, a quick little, um, lesson I should say on flight zone. And so moving on to the next slide, the flight zone is also impacted by the sight perception in cattle. And cattle's eyes are positioned at the sides of their heads, which you can see in, in this picture, and that allows them to see 300 degrees around them. However, they do have poor depth perception and they see very limited colors. So when we are working with cattle, we need to try to avoid shadows. And if we can, it's great to have a good lighting over the entry points. If it's not too hot, we don't wanna make it warmer if we're in hot temperatures. Um, today, very cold, something we won't have to worry about. And then we'd like to see solid walls on loading ramps and handling chutes so it can hide distractions for them since they can see so far around them. And then we can go to the next slide, Cheryl. So knowing a little bit more about their flight zone and their sensory perceptions, how should I approach cattle when I'm working with them to make sure that I'm safe? So the safest approach is to announce that you're there through a touch to their front or side. You want to avoid loud noises. 
and you want to identify and correct any reasons that the cattle may be balking or stopping moving when you are working with the cattle. And we can go to the next slide. So this is just an example of if you are working in a facility, uh, say with through alleys or shoots with cattle, and um, we want to make sure that we're moving forward into the chute or the palpation rail. As you can see, our path to move them forward in this um, uh, image here, and then their point of balance over the shoulder. We don't want to walk up the same alley that they're trying to go out. And again, our swing gates uh, can be used as pinch points. And also, depending what type of facility you're working in, we want to make sure that we're adapting our walking pattern into the, to the facility and what the cattle can see. So when we have solid walls or panels and the cattle can't see the handler, then use this um, of the return path is not as critical. But if you are up on a catwalk, they would be distracted by you. So as you move past them going to their rear, they will move forward. But if the catwalk is not wide enough, you'll need to step off of it for your return path. So just a couple of different examples to make sure that you are being safe, uh, depending um, on what facility or alley or chute you could be working with. And then just to wrap up talking about cattle on the next slide, they are definitely, again, have that herd instinct. They prefer to be in the herd and not be alone. We always want to make sure that we're working to move the leader and not pushing on the followers. So we're working in the safest uh, manner possible with the cattle herd. And we want to allow the animals to follow one another in the direction that they are facing. And now Jackie is going to talk about the different um, behaviors with some of the different cattle. Yeah, so, uh, you know, my story, the bull got me, but as we know on farms, it's not just bulls that can be attack animals. Fresh cows and heifers are especially, can be very protective. Um, you can usually tell where the new calf is in a, a calving pen or if they're out on pasture because all the cows kind of want to huddle around that calf and not leave it alone. Um, and also like the first time getting that fresh cow or heifer into a barn they've never been in or a parlor that they've never stepped in is really important um, to try to get them to move with a group. They seem to like to follow others or you might have to bribe them, uh, maybe put a little corn or hay or something right inside that door of the barn to get them to come in and give them a little time to to snoop it out and kind of see what they're what new thing they're going into uh, you can go to the next slide please Cheryl but do remember that bulls tend to uh, create the most accidents um, the worst ones tend to be those that are home raised and hand fed. Um, I know on our farm, our kids love petting the calves when they're feeding them. Uh, and that can be some of the worst things you can do is when the animal becomes more of a pet than just an animal on the farm. So never allow them to headbutt. Um, if you do want to pet an animal, especially a young bull, pet them anywhere but on the forehead. And never turn your back and run from a bull. When you once you start running, that bull knows that it's game on, full on attack. And never leave bulls penned alone. Um, they do better when they're in groups. And you can go to the next slide. And this slide, we have a video of a bull showing some signs of aggression. Hopefully we can get it to go here. Um, so you should be able to hear the bull making some noises, some um, grunting type noises. He's pawing at the ground, his head is down, his shoulders are kind of hunched. Um, he, he's kind of indicating that a person has entered into his flight zone and he's ready to go ahead and fight. Um, so making sure you know when you're working around a bull, you know, looking for these signs, uh, the one that 
definitely attacked me was he had his head down and he he was totally ready for a fight. So uh, next, I think we have uh, moving cattle and barns. So always make sure you have an escape route. Uh, know where those people passes are, where there's a door you can get out. Um, keeping things, the floor drains, manure channels covered. That way, if, in case you need to take off in a hurry, you don't end up falling in a hole and hurting yourself. Don't forget get between an animal and a gate. Um, it could be a great crushing, crushing point for you. You could end up, you know, if you're up against a crowd gate, be pinned between the animal and the, that gate. And also make sure that you're also not between an animal and a solid surface. So always, always know when you go into a pen or the barn or wherever, if you're working with cattle, have that escape route planned. That way, if you need to make a quick a getaway, you can do that. And so now, Cheryl, are you gonna transition us? Yes, thank you so much um, to Ashley and Jackie. Uh, different points to consider. I can tell you as a safety specialist, a lot of different cases were running through my head as I was listening to this. So our next part of this program, um, we're gonna get into a couple of special animal handling situations. And our first one that we're going to be discussing is going to be worker safety um, during shot administration and Lissa Seafelt is going to be our presenter. Lissa, are you ready to roll? Yes, thanks Cheryl. So we can hop to the next slide there. Excellent. So what are some of the biggest dangers um, that we may encounter when we get into those closer quarters um, with animals when we're administering shots? There's really kind of four key ones um, that we came up with um, that includes injuries due to improper restraint, needle sticks, so the physical trauma of a needle um, actually sticking through your skin, potentially into bone, um, product absorption through the skin, and then inadvertent product injection into um, you, the human, rather than the intended um, animal. So we can go to our next slide there. Um, um, so when we're talking about proper head restraint, um, most of the time we're going to be working um, maybe with a cattle chute, maybe we're in a palpation rail, but um, maybe it's a headlock. Um, and those should be sufficient for most scenarios of our routine everyday uh, vaccinations and things like that. But there may be some certain scenarios um, where we really do want to take some extra time to fully restrain that head and neck area. Um, with a halter um, because there may be some um, particular products that are going to um, need a little bit of special care. And we can head to the next slide, please. Okay, and so when we're talking about preventing needle sticks, um, there's a few things that we can do. Um, one of the first things that I want to mention um, needle sticks are a really common uh, on-farm injury and something that maybe doesn't get reported um, as often as it actually occurs, but from the reports that we do have, um, there's a report from the Upper Midwest uh, Agricultural Safety um, and Health Center uh, that indicated that 80% of farm workers that are vaccinating animals or administering other shots have inadvertently stuck themselves um, with a needle. So that really just brings home the fact that we really do need to be careful. Um, and this is something that uh, happens um, very easily um, because there's a lot of moving pieces when we have animals involved. Um, so there's a lot of uh, things that we need to be um, paying attention to when we are using needles. And so one of the first things that we wanna make sure we do before we actually um, inject any products, we do wanna make sure that we are trained in our protocol um, prior to actually administering any product to our animals. Okay, um, we don't want to be putting needles in our pockets. That's a big no-no. And we don't want to be putting needle caps in our mouths. I know that um, that is a temptation to pull the needle cap off um, with your mouth. Don't do it. There's a lot of bad things that can happen. Um, and then don't rush your injections. Always take your time. Uh, if the animal is moving too much, stop, pause, 
let them settle down, uh, and then go back to your procedure. And then finally, uh, make sure that we properly dispose of needles uh, in, pu in puncture-proof uh, sharps containers to make sure that we're not inadvertently injuring um, animals or ourselves with improper disposal. And then we can head to the next slide there. Great. Um, so one thing that we might encounter is if we have animals um, that are down. And one of the things that we want to mention um, is that we kind of have really three key working zones with animals. Um, and I apologize for those of you that may have some um, color blindness issues. We do have a red zone and a green zone and a yellow zone. So the green zone is the working zone. Um, the red zone is the danger zone, the don't enter zone, and then the yellow zone around the head is really where only an experienced handler should be working, okay? Um, so we wanna make sure that when we are um, working with animals, we're working in a safe manner and uh, approaching animals um, safely. So we wanna make sure that if we have an animal that's down that we need to be uh, working with, that we're uh, starting from that uh, back side of that animal in that working zone um, where they're not able to throw their head around and hurt you. Um, and also keep in mind that there's, um, you know, if you're working with other species besides cattle, there may be uh, situations where, um, you know, biting can occur. So that's something to just be aware of as well. Um, but we really don't want to be entering that danger zone um, because that's where uh, animals can be um, kicking and, and things like that. So we don't want to be entering that zone if we need to be working with that animal. So Lissa, we're going to just pause a moment to let our interpreters switch. Okay. So we'll um, give a break here and I am going to advance the slide. Eric, when you're ready, just give me a head nod. Okay, Lissa, we will be good. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then um, as we look at this slide, um, a couple of headlines here that I uh, wanted to just uh, point out. Um, a harsh reminder of mycotil's danger and cattleman dies due to accidental injection. And so these are just a couple of the stories um, that are out there on a particular product um, that really brings home the the importance of uh, knowing what product you're working with, reading that product label, and making sure that you have proper animal restraint when working with um, some particular products. And, and this is especially important as we're talking about um, needle sticks because this happens to be uh, injectable product that was um, kind of the culprit behind this. Um, so there may be certain products um, beyond this one that I happen to mention um, that are really um, common day used in our uh, everyday lives when we're working on a farm, um, especially ones that are involved in uh, reproductive synchronization protocols that we may want to be uh, making sure that we're taking some extra caution with um, when we're handling them. And so this particular product that I highlighted um, here um, has caused actually in the last 25 years, um, 25 deaths, not just needle sticks or trauma, but actual deaths. Um, and so it's a, a product that's very effective at its intended task in dealing with um, repro or respiratory issues, um, but it is not very friendly to the human body. Um, and so the last uh, death that I had found on this particular product was from back in 2016, which was only a few years ago. Um, and due to the challenges that this particular product presented on the human safety side of things, they actually developed some special um, administration syringes to help keep workers safe while uh, using this particular product. So um, always know that when you're using products, know what you're working with, and some of them do warrant taking some extra time to restrain um, that head and neck area to make sure that we can safely administer a product. Um, I mentioned that we do want to know what is actually in um, the particular product that we're using. So that is um, something, a skill that we need to develop um, that we don't necessarily have uh, right away. And so learning to read a drug label is very important. Um, there's different parts of a drug label. Um, you're always going to have a particular 
um, kind of trade name that's listed on your label, you're going to have um, the actual active ingredient and then you're going to have uh, directions for use, indications, and the really important um, piece to be paying attention to when we're talking about the human safety side of things um, is the cautions and the warnings. That's where you're going to get a lot of details um, about how that product um, may be affecting human health if there's issues, uh, special precautions that you need to be taking. And one of the things that I'd like to mention um, is that there are some extra um, pieces of information that we can hunt down um, that we should have on our farms available to our workers. And if you're a worker, um, they should uh, be available to you. So that if you have questions, you can um, dive in a little bit deeper. And this is called safety data sheets. And there's 16 different um, pieces to a safety data sheet. And we're gonna highlight about five of them that are going to be helpful pieces when you're looking at um, finding additional information on your um, animal health products, whether that's vaccinations or um, antibiotics, other uh, products that you'd be using animal health wise. Okay, um, so we can go to the next slide. So the first one that I want to highlight is hazard identification. And so the particular um, product that I have um, highlighted on the safety data sheet is um, called Lutalyse. And I've actually worked with this product in a previous job um, when I was in the swine industry. Um, and there, this is a product that's used to induce um, farrowing in uh, pigs. And if we can see the really tiny text at the bottom of this slide, um, the hazard indication uh, shows that it's a, this particular product has uh, reproductive implications um, in that supplemental information section uh, at the bottom. And in cattle, this particular product is used to help lyse the corpus luteum. <clears throat> so that's something that um, we may be uh, utilizing on a regular basis. Okay, and this section also indicates that there are potential respiratory problems that could result from injection or absorption uh, exposure to this product. Okay, for first aid measures, this is another section we're going to briefly highlight. Um, we can pull some information out of this section. Um, as well as what we may need to do if we're exposed to this particular product. This particular section uh, indicates that uh, gastrointestinal disturbance may be another symptom that we might see if we're exposed to this particular product, um, say through our skin, okay? We can go to our next slide. Uh, the handling and storage section um, and exposure control, um, this, gives you some information on handling that product safely, um, as does the exposure control and um, PPE section. And so uh, this tells us that spills of this product should be immediately washed off of the skin uh, to prevent or slow absorption uh, of the product. And uh, we'll also learn in this uh, section that uh, we should wear gloves when administering this product to prevent contact with the skin. Okay. Our next section um, is the toxicological uh, information section. And this is really where um, we can get some uh, details about um, harmful effects and uh, exposure of this product um, to us. And so here in this particular one, we'll learn that um, there's reproductive impacts and also reactions of those that may have a respiratory challenge with uh, exposure to this particular product. So a question becomes, why does lutalyse have such a vast array of effects on the human body? Um, and the answer is that it can cause smooth muscle contractions. So those muscles that you uh, don't necessarily have direct control over, such as your respiratory system, your gastrointestinal tract, um, and reproductive tract in both men and women. 
And so it makes it a, a tricky product uh, when you get exposed to it because it can cause issues that you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. Okay, so whenever we are um, utilizing products, we do want to keep that safety in mind, um, especially when we're administering reproductive um, protocols. So we want to make sure that we read that label. We want to make sure that we're following recommended safety procedures. Um, we want to use our personal protective equipment, um, especially if uh, there's gloves that are recommended or required by our label or our protocols. Um, so make sure that we're following those um, per our protocols because they are there, to, um, that those steps are there to protect um, you. We can go to the next slide. And then we did just want to mention that it is important to keep in mind that there are um, zoonotic diseases that can be passed back and forth between animals and people. And we have a few of them uh, listed here. This is by no means the all-inclusive list, um, but it is some of the more common ones that we may encounter on a farm scenario. Um, this would include things like brucellosis, cryptosporidium, um, Lyme's disease, uh, ringworm, tuberculosis, and uh, others. Um, so as always, whenever we're working with animals, practice good hygiene. Thank you, Lissa. A lot to consider. Um, made me think as we were going through some of those SDS parts about working with farms and the value with your hazard communication programs. Um, the drugs were often a missed part of, of working on those programs. So next up, we're going to be talking about handling a down cow with Amber O'Brien from Calumet County. So Amber, are you ready? Yes, I am, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming most of you know what a down cow is, but a down cow is a cow that has fallen and cannot get back up on her own, and she will need human assistance. So we're just going to do a quick poll question here. Does your farm have protocols for handling down cows? All right, thank you for those of you who are who answered to that polling question. It looked like the majority of you do have uh, protocols for down cows and there's a few that don't. So the goal uh, that you want to achieve when you are uh, handling a down cow is that you want to prevent further injuries uh, and maximize the chance of the recovery for the cow, ensuring welfare and keeping both the cow and her human caretaker safe. You need to act immediately as soon as you see a down cow and that does not always mean that whoever discovers the down cow is the one that should be the one to go and help her stand up. Um, but it does mean that you need to assess the situation uh, and look at potential safety hazards. So no one should perform any actions or make decisions above their training abilities and immediate action could simply be uh, calling the herd manager or uh, whoever's on that contact list um, and keeping other cows away from the down cow until trained personnel arrive on the scene. If, if a cow is left for too long unattended, uh, they'll have decreased blood flow and her limbs and other parts of her body due to heavy pressure will lessen her chance of recovery and only make the situation worse. And although we are focusing on the employee safety for, for this webinar series, um, both employee safety and cow safety go hand in hand um, in every situation and worker safety is always the first priority. Go to the next slide. So when you're preparing for um, any of these down cow situations, um, you need to establish a chain of command. And since farming is a 
uh, or dairy farming is a 24 hour through a 65 day job, you're gonna want more than one person on that contact list of who to call. That person should be trained um, and should be able to be at the farm um, in a timely manner. And this could be the herd manager, the farm owner, assistant herd manager, veterinarian, or anyone who has had proper training in handling a down cow. Uh, each farm should have a standard, or a standard operating procedure on how to manage a down cow, so that way the employees can reference it um, and any changes uh, that need to be made can be made. So everyone who is expected to help in a down cow situation should not only have access to these standard of procedures, but also continuous refresher training on proper animal handling and managing a down cow. Um, and you're gonna want to work with your herd veterinarian on developing this, these protocols and the training. Um, and in, in these uh, protocols, you need to make sure, again, you include that contact list, how to assess the down cow and the next steps that should be taken. It's also a good idea to go over the equipment uh, that you use um, when handling a down cow and when you should be using that equipment. And that could be a halter, skid loader, um, an appropriate bucket uh, to use on the skid loader, straps, hobbles, or whatever you use uh, to handle a down cow. Next slide. Uh, so when you assess the situation, um, there's a few questions that, you, that should be asked um, before you go to just help the cow stand up. Um, you need to make sure that the cow is, is in a safe area where she's laying down. So if there's, uh, you may need to redirect cow traffic, whether you got to put, put up gates or, or any way to make sure that uh, that cow is safe and then the workers around her who are going to be helping her hopefully stand back up will be safe as well. Um, you're going to want to check the cow for any injuries or illnesses. If she's down due to milk fever, uh, she should be treated immediately. It's, um, it's best to treat the cow if she has milk fever before you try to get, before you try to get her to uh, stand up. So, um, so you want to follow the herd health protocols um, when you're attempting to uh, help the cow up. There may be automatic scrapers in the barn that need to be turned off. Um, and you're gonna want to check the cow's history as well before proceeding on, on how you're gonna get her up. How many days fresh is she? Is she pregnant? Has she had any lamenesses in the past? These are all things that you need to assess before uh, helping the cow stand up. So you want to be sure that the floor under the cow has some friction to it. And this may involve spreading some lime or sand around the area. And this is not only to help the cow stand up, but to also give uh, some friction to the employees who are, who are around the cow and helping them from slipping out as well. So you're gonna want to allow for at least four feet of space in the front of the cow to, to help her up. So don't be in her way, do not be standing in the front of the cow because they have, um, they need that lunge space in order to stand up. Some other questions to ask while Just assessing- Just a, a quick pause, Amber, our interpreter okay, yep. switch. Yep. Thank you. All right, you're good. So a few questions to ask uh, can be, is she lying down? Are her back legs in the splits? If so, you need to be careful and be sure you protect yourself as you attempt to get her legs back together, uh, whichever way that might be. Multiple people will nearly always be involved in this process. So you're gonna wanna communicate a plan uh, before attempting to help the cow up. And I'm not gonna get into detail on every exact technique on how to uh, handle the cow in each situation, but it is important that everyone who is helping knows the complete plan 
to get the cow up. And this will help prevent the cow from further injury and decrease chances of any people being injured. Some other types of down cow situations would include her laying flat out or casting or if she's caught in anything. Make sure that if she's caught in a pipe or stall or gate that you get permission uh, to, if you need to cut a pipe or something, um, get that permission before you do so. And if the cow is thrashing, do not get anywhere near her legs. You got to give her some time to calm down, but keep in mind that she could kick out or whip her head at any moment. While it's uncommon in dairy cattle, don't disregard the fact that in some situations when they're in pain or they're fearful, they could, the cow could turn mean. And even if she gets up uh, to stand up, you need to make sure that you have a rapid exit path because she is heavier than you and you don't uh, want to attempt to control her once she's up. Next slide. So you all have already seen this image before, uh, but uh, just wanted to refresh uh, your memory with this of the working zone, uh, the experienced handle, handler zone and the, uh, the do not enter zone. So an acceptable way of approaching a down cow would to be slowly come from her rear then to her shoulder and not from the front if possible but you, you always need to make sure that she knows that you are there. So if you're coming from behind, make sure that you can at least make eye contact with her and that so she can see that, that you're there. And then, yeah, you can work your way towards her shoulder and, and um, you know, help the cow in whatever situation that you're in. Next slide, please. So when you're moving her to a safe location, um, you, you typically want to have a designated area specifically for a down cow and that would be um, usually a bed pack hospital area. Uh, you never want to leave a cow outside, um, get her in some soft bedding and that will provide for plenty of, tr of traction for you and her in, re in getting her to stand. Um, Equipment to move a down cow should always be ready, readily available. And if you have uh, the cow bundled up, and I have a picture there of a bundled up cow, um, that is a technique used um, using a halter and a rope to hold the cow in a position where she cannot flail around and injure herself or anyone else. And this can be used uh, to transport her if you have a, a large skid loader bucket uh, to move her to a safe location. Uh, there's other techniques that include rolling her onto a mat or a piece of plywood um, that can be pulled by a skid loader. So when, when you're handling the cow and you're using a skid loader, make sure that uh, you don't get your hand caught when you're applying any of the straps or have your hand um, in any, any of the straps that you're using when the skid loader is pulling. Uh, just let the skid loader uh, handle the weight um, and make sure that you have a skid loader that um, is capable of, of carrying a, um, a heavy cow. And you never want to mechanically drag a cow uh, with a direct attachment to her body part. Um, and remember that her skin is her primary immune barrier. So dragging her and tearing up, open her skin will only cause more problems. So um, just remember, you're not just attempting to move her, you are trying to save her. So every step counts in that final goal of a complete recovery for the cow while keeping everyone safe. Next slide. So here are just some acceptable and not acceptable uh, points to make when you're trying to help her stand, um, speaking at her, yelling, clapping hands, just really encouraging her 
to stand up um, are, are, accept, are acceptable ways. It is not acceptable to uh, hit the cow or poke her with sharp objects or use excessive prod use. Next slide. So you need to be very patient. Uh, in most situations, uh, the halter should be removed before asking her to stand up so she can lunge and move freely while attempting to stand up. However, regardless of her current temperament, uh, she, she may make the situation worse by attempting to run once she is standing and potentially injure uh, one of the people that's, that's helping. So sometimes leaving the halter on could um, help guide her in her speed and direction, but that's only if the situation allows for that. And it's keep in mind that it's not always muscle, but proper technique that can give the cow the best chance to stand up and keep all of the workers safe. You do not want to lift a cow too high up off the ground to the point where she cannot touch. And, um, and all of these uh, standing assistance techniques should be in the protocol book used for the down cows. Uh, always choose the lowest risk, least technical means of movement. So you don't want to overcomplicate things. You want to work smoothly and be dedicated to the plan to help her up. And once you have the movements planned, you don't hesitate because that may make uh, the, that may give her an opportunity to overthink the situation or an employee to overthink the situation. Um, so you want to have a set plan to action and follow through with those smoothly. And once she's up, uh, make sure that the cow has a dedicated area to recover away from other cattle where it's uh, easy for other herdsmen to take care of her and always move very, very slowly with her. Um, she could be very, um, she could be shaking or wobbling and uh, she may not be quite ready to walk yet. So always be watching for those signs. And remember that you will not always be successful in attempting to get the cow up, um, but always have a plan uh, for next steps to take to ensure for pro proper welfare of the cow. Next step, please. Thank you. So in summary, uh, again, worker safety is the number one priority, um, followed by the cow's safety and well-being. Every farm should have a protocol to follow for down cow situations, and equipment needs to be readily available. Employees need to be trained regularly in order to achieve the goal of keeping everyone safe and allowing the cow to stand or to stand and fully recover. So here are some resources that I included in this slide um, that are, are great for your employee or if you're an employer or for um, any farm worker to, to read over um, that help guide um, down cow situations. Thanks, Amber. And that is a really important area. I know I've been involved in discussing a couple of cases where employees were injured when they were moving those down cows. We're going to move quickly um, to Lisa again um, to wrap us up with livestock transportation safety. All right. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, let me go ahead and advance there. Great. Um, so one of the things we did want to mention um, is just a little bit about when we're loading animals, what should we be doing? Um, and so I just want to point out on this slide that we have a graphic maybe of a holding area outside um, and we have a bunch of animals that we want to uh, move uh, maybe towards where we have a trailer waiting for us and how do we get those animals to go where we want and one of the best ways to do that is to use a zigzag pattern um, get yourself behind that group of animals get them facing the right direction where you want them to head and then you're going to be um, 
walking a zigzag pattern kind of perpendicular to the direction that those animals are facing. Um, and that's going to have those animals think that um, there's more than one of you there because as you walk back and forth, um, they're uh, tracking you with one eye versus, so maybe the right eye versus the left eye. And so that gives the illusion that there's maybe more people uh, there than there actually is. So you can use that to your advantage. Um, and then once you have those animals moving, uh, allow them to um, kind of flow at their speed um, that they want to move at. Um, let them, you know, go at that speed that's comfortable for them. You don't want them uh, rushing. Let the um, flow happen naturally. Use that group herding uh, instinct. And then once that animal flow starts, um, don't continue to push them, let them flow forward. Um, if they start hesitating, that's when you can do a little bit more pressure, work up a little bit closer to them, um, but let them um, kind of move at that pace and that will really help you be able to load those animals um, easier, especially if you're in a larger area, maybe in an outdoor holding pen. So we can go to the next slide. Um, when we're talking about uh, trailers, we did want to mention that there's a few places that you want to be careful. Um, and it's going to sound a little bit silly, but there's a couple places that you have to watch out for your safety. So if you're hooking that trailer up um, to that truck, um, gooseneck trailers are fairly common on farms. And when you're hooking that gooseneck coupler to that truck, um, there's definitely a couple of uh, potential times where you could get your fingers pinched. So, you know, be careful with that. Make sure your fingers aren't in the wrong place at the right time. Um, likewise, you know, you can uh, bash your knuckles on the trailer jack. So be aware of that. Um, you know, on the far side of a trailer, there might be an escape door. And anytime that there's a door, there's a potential to get uh, fingers or arms or hands pinched. So be aware of that. And also on the inside of those trailers, make sure to watch for those pinch points where you have doors that are swinging or sliding shut, especially if you need to um, swing or slide them shut fairly quickly because you have an animal that may be turned back and is wanting to pop out. Make sure that your hands and fingers are out of the way before that door uh, slams into them. You go to that next slide. A quick pause for our interpreters here, Melissa. Mm -hmm. And we're Thanks, good. Thanks, Amanda. I'm all set. Okay. Um, and then when we're moving our animals, um, we just want to remind you, um, always make sure that we're avoiding those unnecessary noises because that is a distraction for the animals. If they're moving fine um, and going where you want them to, you just want to be kind of quiet and stay out of their way. Um, when we're loading into a trailer, we do want to make sure that we have some proper lighting um, in the interior of that trailer, uh, especially if it's at night, if we have to load at night for some reason. Um, you know, maybe we want to put up a light that faces into the trailer so that the um, inside of that trailer is lit up so that we're preventing that balking um, from going from a nice lit area, perhaps in a barn, to a dark trailer outside at night. Um, that'll help prevent some problems. Uh, likewise, um, we had mentioned earlier that we may want to utilize some solid walls um, in our loading area to avoid some distractions. And if we do see any um, bulking of animals happening, we want to figure out what is causing that bulking, um, ID what's going on there, and then go in and correct that and kind of start over so that we're not um, frustrating the animals and we're not frustrating uh, us as the human workers. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and so some final tips for loading um, for safety. Uh, if you have a trailer that has a higher um, step up, you want to try to get that uh, trailer backed in so that it's lower. Um, so we have a smaller step up. Um, that may mean that we're backing down a little bit of a hill or changing um, that gradient to our loading area so that uh, we have a nice short step up. Um, again, when we're working slow and calm, that is actually faster than trying to force them to move uh, faster than what they want to move at. So um, loading at a walk or at most a trot is really where we want to be uh, for loading animals. We want to make sure that those animals see uh, when you're entering or exiting an area. 
because they want to keep track of where you're at and do you want to know where um, those animals are headed at all times so you want to be able to make sure to watch for that again watch out for those pinch points um, in the trailer because there's a lot of them you don't want to get um, stuck uh, and squeezed between uh, you know gates or between animals um, and we don't want you uh, getting um, pinched either so keep that in mind and hopefully with these uh, tips you should be able to have a more successful loading process that is safe for all involved thank you so much Lisa. some great things on transfer rotation those trailers um, I know we have some other work coming up talking about transporting um, looking chat any questions please feel free to um, put questions in that chat box and our comments and or things that you um, would want to share um, with others or suggestions that you would add to this program. Uh, Why we look for those, I would like to remind everybody that next week, um, February 15th, we have another Badger Dairy Insight and that's getting the most out of your farm data. And you can find those at the link below at Farm Ready Research. I would also promote from the Badger Dairy Insight Safety Series, our fourth and final program on March 9th is Oak Crash, um, Safety Considerations for Ag Vehicles on the Road. This is one that's near and dear to, to my heart um, as I've spent a lot of work on updating the rules of the road and um, know it's an important area and topic. So, We've covered a wide variety of animal and handling today related to that worker safety. Um, you know, there's a lot of different parts to it, lots for you and your farm operations to consider. I would offer that if anyone that's on here is needing a certificate to show that you participated in this webinar, please feel free to reach out to me and in the follow-up email, that will have a link to some evaluation and some other resources related to worker safety and, and animal handling. Um, my contact information or Cheryl Scholas um, at WISC.edu will be part of that. And I'd be glad to, to help give you that certificates either for your OSHA records or your farm certification program, um, whatever you're needed. A special thanks to all of our um, presenters today did a great job of pulling everything together and I also would like to thank um, Jim Larson and Eric Rowland um, for your time and being our interpreters today. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. Amanda, am I missing anything? I don't believe so. I don't see any. Okay, thank you very much. Have a safe day. Stay warm in this weather. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in March. Thank you.